Good uh, evening and good afternoon, everyone. I have the greatest pleasure to welcome you to this African Tea Time session. And it's my greatest honor to first welcome our two presenters. That's uh, Gugu Resha, all the way from South Africa, and Are Bate from Cameroon as well. We really appreciate your time. We know it's quite late from where you're joining us from, but we really definitely want to thank you so much for the sacrifice, for the commitment to be able to take part in this uh, series. So what I'm going to do is to give a very brief introduction. And what we do at Tea Time, Google and Are is to give you an opportunity when your turn comes to speak, please feel free to tell us more about yourself because then that, that's a better way to introduce yourself to people than just read a long profile. So there's some important aspects of yourself that you want to, people to know. So we, we feel that it's a good thing for you to be able to introduce yourself personally. So what I'm going to do here, as you uh, know, for those who, uh, who had a chance to look at the flyer, the talk today is going to focus on the continent of Africa for sure, but uh, we're representing two countries here. The first one is Cameroon and the second one is South Africa. As it regards to the order of presentations, we're going to start with South Africa. That's uh, Gugu Resha is going to be our first presenter and then we'll move along to, to Are Bate from Cameroon. Uh, the topic, the overall general topic that we're going to discuss today, I feel it's an important one, especially for all of us who are living in this generation where the internet, where the social media and all other channels or forms of communication are very active in the digital space. And the topic is digital economy and development in Africa. And um, this discussion, uh, if I may give a brief background uh, in, in terms of planning for the African TTAM events, we do this with uh, a group of students who are in the planning committee and uh, alumni as well. So this topic is among the, the, the contemporary, I should say, topics that people felt like, or the, the planning committee felt like it's something that we need to discuss and see what does the engagement in, in the digital space, especially among the young people, or especially uh, groups that typically didn't have space like this to either express themselves, do business and other kinds of activities that we see uh, in nowadays happening in, in, in the digital space that is so, we're very, very happy and privileged to have two knowledgeable people in this, um, on this topic that are going to lead the discussion. Beginning with uh, Gugu. Gugu is a researcher and data analyst at the Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading Organization in South Africa. And she has a master's in philosophy and public policy. And uh, Gugu has written and I'm sure has uh, researched uh, along the lines of what does the digital economy have to do with Africa in terms of development or in terms of uh, 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 exposure to, to the outside world. And also, uh, uh, Are, Are is uh, an internet entrepreneur, a journalist and author and founder of Are B Media that is in Cameroon. And uh, he was uh, in the British councils, he was among the British councils top 100 young journalists worldwide. And this was in 2019, top 100 young leaders in GLC 2021. And uh, Ari, you're going to tell us more about this. Winner of the 2021 Global Leadership Challenge by Oxford University and St. Galen Symposium. So I wouldn't want to continue giving more remarks about our two esteemed presenters. What I'm going to do right now is to give this time to, to Gugu to start the presentation. And please, Gugu, as I said, feel free to introduce yourself more. Let us know what else we would love to, you would have us to know about yourself. Thank you so much again, and please go ahead. Great, thank you so much, Damaris. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. Um, so I'm just going to set a little timer for myself so that I have a good indication of how I'm doing with time because I can, if I get excited, I might go on and on. Um, so as 
you've all said, um, my name is Gugu, Gugu Letu. Um, my surname is Resha, uh, but Resha is okay because it's uh, phonetically just easier. <laughs> um, and my, yeah, my, my interest in the sort of um, digital, um, digital economy space, um, sort of digitization um, and Africa's role in that or Africa's journey and that has been largely what started off as just like personal interests um, and I think because I'm a bit of a nerd for policy and just you know how how are we cracking developmental challenges at a structural level um, that that sort of sparked my initial thoughts about why I find um, why I find the conversation about digitization interesting and how how we're trying to keep up with the rest of the world, how we're trying to charter our own, um, our own trajectory. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's been the bulk of the work that I've put out there. Um, as Damir said, in my sort of main gig or my main professional um, role, I'm a research and data analyst, um, particularly looking at violence prevention in South Africa. And so I understand that these are quite, um, they seem to be in very different neighborhoods, these, these sort of issues, but I think that's also just testament to the way that my brain works and how, um, how just thematically there's so many different facets of development, right? And there's so many different ways of looking at um, how to make Africa prosperous or how to improve livelihoods for people so that I think the ability to think across disciplines and to think across thematic areas, development thematic areas, um, is something that's really important for people who are interested in policy or just development on the continent. Um, so that's just the background and I guess hopefully meant to fill in the gaps between what you may see on paper versus what I'm now talking about. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it and share this presentation that I've, whoops, there, I think that should be it. Um, yeah, um, can everybody see my slideshow? Yes, it's projected, great. thank you. Great, great, great. Um, just gonna minimize this. Um, yeah, so um, the, the way that I was interested in this conversation was through the lens of prioritizing women and youth. Um, and I think the, that framing speaks to, you know, where the largest stakes lie um, in terms of who, you know, where the potential for our continent lies um, in terms of, you know, digital inclusion, in terms of financial inclusion, but also in terms of general participation. Um, I think we're all familiar with the conversations around um, you know, no, leaving nobody left behind and also just the benefits that we stand to gain from tapping into the largely excluded um, women and youth demographics. Um, and so, yeah, I think the, the digital economy has potential to develop, you know, economies at scale, but also um, has the potential to improve um, and, Yes, basically to improve the, the individual livelihoods of people, um, even at sort of the micro level, um, even beyond conversations around economic growth or sort of, you know, GDPs and all of that. But I think people who are plugged into the internet and do have access to the internet um, are fast recognizing that it's, you know, it's become elevated even to the point of being seen as, you know, basic service. Um, there's... And this is a slight, by the way, um, you know, talks from the UN um, about, you know, including it as part of rights into a rights framework, you know, talking about digital rights and access being one of those things, because in the 21st century, it's, you know, it, it, there's so much opportunity that is gained through just the access alone to the internet. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of the lens that I've been that I've been focusing on. Um, so just to give a brief overview overview into the African context in terms of you know the digital landscape, 
um, or digital transformation in terms of the policy landscape. Um, so there is currently at the largest multi multilateral level, the African Union's um, Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa. And there's the um, Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. So these pieces of um, policy are basically aimed at increasing cooperation or um, amongst African countries, creating a standard benchmark for how to charter their own um, national policies relating to, you know, creating their own digital strategy, but also, you know, creating cybersecurity frameworks um, and that sort of thing. I think what we've seen is um, a lot of regional and multilateral cooperation in, you know, in Europe, for instance. Um, I think many of us are aware of how they've tackled the um, the personal privacy or personal information through the GDPR, um, using that as a continental wide strategy or piece of legislation so that all the com all the countries that are within Europe are basically governed or treated or have their data treated um, through sort of in a standard way or in a uniform way through this one piece of um, legislation. And I think Africa is sort of moving towards a similar direction. Um, but because, of course, you know, the African Union is quite fragmented in a lot of ways that the European Union isn't and in some ways less developed than the European Union. Um, so the ratification of these uh, policies and these strategies, so basically the, um, the localization into the specific national policies or national legal frameworks has been quite slow. Um, the, I think uh, only four, 14 countries have actually signed the convention eight have ratified it, so have made it legally, legally binding um, and aligned it to their own laws. And only um, under 10 countries have um, data protection regulatory authorities. And I think that speaks a lot to you know, the potential of how safe people feel using the internet or taking up the internet as a regular place that you know, they can uh, use to secure their livelihoods, um, to you know, conduct frequent transactions, financial transactions. Um, I think many of us may take it for granted that you know we can sort of carry out uh, digital finance, just sort of financial transactions. But in a lot of places, that's still quite a foreign idea. And I think there's still a lot of paranoia about how safe is it? How safe is my information? How safe is my personal data? Um, and setting some of these um, legislative structures in place helps to assure people, but also ensures that you know there's recourse if there are any um, if there are any sort of um, any offenses, basically. Um, and so the the coordination at that policy level um, is basically covered by the term called digital governance. Um, and that's just creating the umbrella framework of laws, of regulations, of social structures, um, of institutions that's meant to coordinate um, the digital economy, all of, you know, sort of digital products, um, e-commerce, attracting investments in order to develop um, access to the internet and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the lens of, of my, my analysis or just, you know, this discussion. Um, so I had written a discussion paper last year titled um, Assessing the Potential for African Digital Governance to Facilitate Inclusive Development. And the, the three areas I focused on were, were um, rights, rules, and revenues. So I know that's you know, quite a mouthful, but I think the, the central idea was if Africa is to charter its own path towards, you know, building its own di digital transformations. Um, if different countries are meant to create their own blueprints in terms of how they want to develop, you know, their um, digital economies, what would be the most fundamental things? Um, and there's quite a lot of conversations about this out there. There's a lot of um, research that's gone into it. The UN has quite a bit of work done into it. Um, Specific countries have, you know, some of them have established ministries to determine what are the main priorities. 
um, for this sort of thing. And, you know, there's also a lot of multilateral work that's happening um, through the African Union. So you'll see a lot of different conversations about what people think are the main things to get right first before launching into trying to keep up with the rest of the world. And I think the thing that sums this up for me is um, avoiding a tunnel vision. So on the one hand, we want to focus on creating jobs, on you know, economic growth and those sort of things, but you can't have a conversation about you know, increasing revenues and economic growth and development without thinking about the rights, um, whether there's equal opportunity to participate in um, in the in you know the internet or just the digital space, whether broadband um, or fiber is accessible to people, whether it's affordable to people, um, thinking of rights, uh, uh, thinking of skills, sorry, as part of rights. So whether people are getting digital education, and while that might not have been a thing, you know, maybe ten years ago, or fifteen years ago, but part of you know giving people the opportunity to participate and to, um, to maximize the benefits of the digital economy would be that they can engage at that level and they have the skills, the tools to do that. Um, the second thing was the, the rules around establishing digital economies. So do we have the right sort of protections? Do we have the right sort of um, regulated frameworks to make sure that, you know, there's fair competition amongst bigger businesses and smaller businesses. I think um, some of us might be aware of the sort of headlines in European countries and, you know, in the States about the big sort of tech companies and all sorts of legal um, difficulties that they've been running into. So for instance, Facebook's, um, your Google, your Apple's, and there's all sorts of, you know, little nitty gritty things that um, because of the newness, the relative newness of the digital space, some of those legal structures or legal frameworks may not have been established before. So things around, you know, um, uh, sort of predatory advertising, things around data mining and harvesting people's information. I think Ari might have some interesting things to say about this, um, you know, having the hands-on experience of, you know, running an, a digital um, marketing company. So there's all sorts of, you know, murky ethical spaces there that it's really important for Africa to sort of prepare itself for um, and to just sort of uh, start laying the groundwork so that, you know, you have a full functioning system um, or at least a ready system before, you know, people start establishing all of these, um, start taking advantage of those opportunities and establishing, you know, the, the various things within that space. Um, and the final thing is the, the revenues, right? Everybody wants to know how much can we make from the digital economy? How, can, how much can we make from internet connectivity? Um, not just at a personal level, you know, where people are like, how can I make money online, but also um, people want to know sort of how do how do governments, how do um, countries raise their own revenues by harnessing digital economies. Um, so those are those are some of the things that you know I discuss in the paper there. I will um, if anybody's interested, I could provide a link to that where I just discuss it um, in quite a lot of detail. Um, and I basically looked at, I compared um, four countries, so um, Kenya, Morocco, South Africa, and Nigeria, which have some of the most prominent sort of digital um, footprints on the continent. So that was that was that, that sort of uh, conversation starter into this work. Um, and then the, the first thing that I wanted to look at is the sort of participation of youth. Um, and I think one of the really important things is leveraging the youth demographic. I think we're all aware of how sizable the youth demographic is in Africa, especially relative to um, older demographics, but also relative to um, other parts of the world. The majority of our population consists of people who are under the age of 25. Um, and, you know, theoretically or ideally, these are the people who are most digitally savvy. But of course, given the, um, you know, some of the barriers towards access to um, even just internet products because of, you know, widespread poverty on the continent, because of lack of infrastructure. Um, it's really difficult to even start speaking about young people participating in a digital economy if, 
you know, uh, data isn't affordable, if broadband isn't available, if infrastructure um, is only concentrated in urban spaces or cities rather than um, in, in sort of across countries and across, you know, rural uh, and uh, peri, peri rural, peri urban spaces. So that's some of the things to consider. Um, there are some catalysts to youth participation. So things such as public-private partnerships have shown some, uh, some interesting results in terms of accelerating youth participation. Um, I think where government has met the private sector and you know, sort of uh, actively encouraged subsidies and training programs, um, building digital skills, that sort of thing, um, those, those have yielded some positive results in, um, in places such as Kenya, for instance, where there's, there are actual sort of digital skill building schools. Um, and the, you know, the, the final dimension is just, you know, what happens between the policy and practice. Um, and, you know, there, you know, countries are sort of looking at creating national or digi uh, national digital policies or ICT strategies and that sort of thing. And there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm around, um, you know, increasing participation of young people and sort of setting a precedent for that through planning. But at the same time, we see this sort of erratic um, behavior, which is largely influenced by um, politics, where, you know, we see a lot of internet shutdowns um, and bans of social media sites. I think we're familiar with, you know, Nigeria banning Twitter, for instance. Um, and I think, you know, the joke for us who are online and who are sort of plugged into these conversations is that, you know, obviously they don't think about the existence of VPNs and VPNs basically allow you to, you know, remain anonymous and, you know, hide your location from, you know, whoever might be tracking it. And, you know, Nigerians have never left Twitter, quite frankly. And that just also speaks to a disconnect between the people who are setting the policy and the people who actually engage with digital products and just, you know, the internet and social media and that sort of thing. So there's there's that little bit of a disjuncture in that, in that sphere. Um, the second component is um, the participation of women and where we currently stand with regards to that on, you know, the, the most sort of salient level, if we think about barriers to the participation of women, sort of gender parity in its own realm is one of the biggest things. So the, the sort of unequal access to digital and financial services for women um, compared to men on the continent is still quite big. And so that means, you know, even if women are wanting to participate and, you know, improve their own livelihoods, through the internet and the opportunities that exist on the internet, some of these social dynamics, some of these social cultural dynamics, political dynamics have quite a bit to do with, um, have quite a bit of an influence on, you know, how much people can participate. Um, some of the catalysts to the participation has been, you know, the rise of gender sensitive interventions or um, gender mainstreaming in policy discussions. I think if you look at um, any sort of policy coming out of most countries these days, um, even on the continent, there will be a gender lens, there will be a gender specific sort of uh, consideration um, about, you know, how do we, how do we uh, garner the support or the sort of the, the inclusion of women um, in that space. And I think that's, that's starting, that's setting a good precedent to sort of include um, women in the digital space, in the startup space, in the tech space. Um, and some of those opportunities are slowly rising. The disjuncture between policy and practice, of course, is that you know, there are these gender um, equality aspirations, but there's also the challenge of underrepresentation still, not only within the tech spaces or in the digital spaces or in entrepreneurship and business, but also just at the decision-making level um, where people set those policies, you still see an underrepresentation of women in that space. And that obviously has trickle down effects um, in terms of how much, how, much, how much ground we're covering basically. Um, a short example of you know, this, this disjuncture is um, the, the um, African Free Continental Free Trade Agreement 
and how that sort of bears the promise of, you know, integrating Africa and it's meant to, you know, represent the opportunity for free flow of ideas, of people across borders, of goods, of, you know, money across borders and data and all of that. But um, if you sort of look at the people who um, are at the center of African economies who are typically informal women traders, you see that they're, they're quite left out from, you know, the, these spoils or these opportunities that they're meant to be able to access because of this agreement. The free movement of persons across borders is still quite far from actualization. Um, and what we've seen is that this seems to be something that's more attainable for, you know, people who are working in formal industries. And so that begs the question of, you know, if we want to move to a point where um, we can share information, we can share um, money across borders, share ideas, how are, we, how are we thinking about the people who are most vulnerable or the most excluded from that conversation? Um, but also how do, we, how, how do we set the pay, how do we set the stage at a policy level to ensure that we're incorporating the informal sector, um, which is already carrying our continent, um, but also with, you know, the promises of, you know, digitization and some of the efficiencies and um, some of the improvements that we can get from that in terms of just even making business operations much more easier, um, much more transparent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, you know, the, the, one of the biggest challenges to, um, and I'm just going to speed through this a little bit because I'm aware of my time. Um, one of the, the sort of big questions for, you know, African countries about our future with, you know, the digital economy is what are we going to do with the large level of informality? Um, can we use our largely informal industries and economies to leverage innovation and inclusion? And I think the example is, you know, looking at the rise of platform work. Um, so looking at uh, platforms such as e-hailing services, um, such as, you know, Uber and um, the Boda Bodas in some places, where we see how technology has made this, um, has made the operations of these businesses so much more seamless for people working there. It's made it um, more reliable, a little bit more safer for consumers as well. Um, and there are all these benefits that we can get from uh, digitizing the work that we're already doing. But there's this hostility that keeps emerging um, towards, you know, informal traders, informal workers, um, where, you know, you see that they don't have a lot of labor rights, they don't have a lot of freedoms. And, you know, when there are general concerns that exist in any other industry, they're met with very erratic responses, um, so such as banning uh, the you know, the, the e-hailing services or um, that sort of thing, um, leaving them quite susceptible to violence and um, to criminals and that sort of thing, because those protections at a rights level, at a regulation level, are not quite ironed out as yet. So those are some of the, um, those are some of the areas of, of improvement. And if we look at the progress thus far, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all, oh, you know, we have all of these challenges. There have been some, you know, notable um, improvements um, and uh, strides that we've taken. So for instance, you know, we have global and continental agreements. We have the frameworks on cybersecurity. People are aware of cyber intelligence and um, of coordinating sort of digital systems across countries. Um, there are all of these conversations that are happening across countries and between governments to, to make sure that there's, you know, learning of best practices as well. That's currently happening. We have governments that are being proactive in terms of, you know, encouraging investments, you know, establishing their own data centers, encouraging local ownership of their own data, trying to protect their citizens um, digitally. Um, we have, you know, increasing digital infrastructure. All of these things are sort of, you know, showing that there's there's positive movement in that direction, and there's there's quite an eagerness to to take action um, uh, and be quite proactive about, you know, growing our digital economies. On the other hand, we also see the emergence of some of our own homegrown e-commerce players. You know, we have Jumia in Nigeria, we have Take a Lot in South Africa, and these are also seen as kind of the Amazons of the African um, the African continent, which is which is quite important for us to, to develop our own. 
Um, and there's, uh, you know, sort of more, I think, more African relevant conversations about how to leverage the digital economy or ICT information technologies for development. So um, sort of address some of the existing social challenges such as service delivery, health challenges, um, uh, education and environmental management. There are all these other currently existing challenges that we're facing that, you know, leveraging um, technologies and tech um, can address. And I think there's there's enough, there's small conversations that are sort of erupting in different places um, that are driving some of these developments and hopefully they'll, you know, they'll start ricocheting across, across the continent. Um, and this is just a, a brief, um, Sort of infographic that looks at the um, the sort of tech hubs that exist across the continent, and you can see there's quite a large disparity in terms of places that have you know quite a large number of tech hubs. You know, sort of places like South Africa, Egypt, and um, and Nigeria that have you know fifty plus hubs, and then they're also quite you know the majority of the continent is sitting with you know an average of one to four hubs. Um, and the thing about the, the tech hubs is that on the one hand, they can seem like a tiny bubble, right? And not an indication of how much a whole country can benefit from a digital economy because it's so niche. But if you think of tech hubs, they're basically the backbone of a digital, a digital ecosystem of you know, the, de the developments, the innovations that are going to take place in that sphere for the next coming years. You know, they're sort of the pioneers of uh, thinking of the infrastructure, the products that, you know, we need, figuring out the, the software behind that. They're basically the problem solvers who are anticipating the country's needs um, and also thinking about the solutions. So it's quite important for us to have these hubs um, and to ensure that they're, they're financially backed and they're sustainable. So there's, I think this image shows that there's, there's quite a long way to go um, in that sense. And to, to close off, just to leave you with um, some of the three things that I think are some of the um, main priorities for uh, developing our digital economies on the continent. The first is upscaling, right? So looking at what already exists, what industries already exist, and how do we plug into um, the digital sphere to sort of increase the impact, to increase the participation into those industries, um, and how to sort of make them scalable, how to upsize them. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, sort of trading, for instance, just selling food, how can digital interventions or digital products increase um, the footprint, the financial footprint that those are generating? Um, the second is obviously to broaden participation um, between urban and rural societies, between men and women, between older generations and youth. Um, it's to sort of figure out what do people need to or in order to facilitate better access for them um, into, you know, digital services or just into the internet. Um, and finally, to, to start thinking about innovating. So how do, we, how do we start thinking about our current problems, our current challenges, and how do we use the internet or the digital um, sphere as a tool rather than as a destination? Um, how to keep the conversation going about, you know, some of our own local challenges. Um, and, and finally, how to think about, you know, creating inclusive development rather than narrow growth for a select few. Um, and I think, I think that sums up my, my thoughts and my, uh, my sort of contributions um, and ideas about the, you know, digital economies on the continent where they stand and, you know, some of our um, considerations for the future going forward. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, you wanted to unshare? To stop sharing. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you so much. You you did. Wow, that's wonderful, Google. Um, it, it's really, it's really amazing how you laid the foundation for discussing for making this discussion a broader like giving a broader view to this discussion, I should say, because you're, you're looking at it from the policy level, you know? Mm -hmm. Because when yeah. we talk about digitization, perhaps sometimes we don't really think of it as, a, as an idea or an ideal that should be achieved at the policy level, at the national level. 
we mm. need go, going forward mm. because I don't really think we're going to go back anymore in terms of technology, in terms of right. uh, digitalization. So I really definitely love uh, your approach to it by looking at the national policies that, that should be uh, effected in order to make this more inclusive, like for inclusive development to occur first, we have to think about the safety issues, the security issues, because right. the society is not, or the civil society to begin with is not going to be comfortable engaging in a space like this in, mo in a more productive way, unless we know that we're secure, we're safe to be in this right. space. We can, we, we can use it. In, mm. However, we, we think it's going to benefit us confidently. So mm. I really definitely love that perspective. I wasn't thinking even about it when <laughs> we were calling yeah. this together, but th that's really wonderful. And um, I would, uh, I don't have a, a question per se right now. I want to give this mm -hmm. time to the audience to uh, engage uh, Google before we move on to the next speaker. So, but thank you so much. That That's, that's a really wonderful base to lay this discussion on. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you so much, Damaris, I appreciate that. Yes, laid on a, on a, a broader scale, that, that's mm. love the fact that um, should be considered when we have these discussions. So mm. our audience, please, anyone with a question, feel free to write that in the chat I haven't checked, or just unmute, raise your hand and comment, ask a question. I don't really think there's any question here on the chat. So does it mean that uh, well, well, Google, you must have done a wonderful job? I hope so. <laughs> I hope that's what the silence means. <laughs> that's what I should. But uh, if we do not have a question or a comment for Google, and if you you at some point in the discussion feel like uh, there's something that you need to ask, feel free to, the floor will continue being open until the end of this uh, event. So if I'm not- um, Damaris, there's a question from Philip. There's a question on the chat? Um, yes. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. And he's asking what drives my interest in this topic. Uh, I think it's, Oh, so, I mean, on the one hand, I had sort of prefaced this earlier with um, the fact that I am quite interested in um, thinking about policy and um, how at the, um, at the sort of upper sort of legislative level um, and sort of institutional level, how we are approaching some of the developmental challenges that we have on the continent. Um, and I think because I... I, I, because I'm an optimist, um, but I also get easily frustrated with piecemeal um, interventions. And so I think there was just a moment where I was thinking about, uh, it's, this is a little bit random, but I think there was a day when I had walked out and gone to the store and didn't have my wallet with me and literally just had my phone and was just like, oh, I needed to get groceries. And was like, well, I can't do much without my wallet. And just remembered that, oh, well, you can just use your phone to pay for things. And from getting from uh, my home to the store, a small digital transaction, just, you know, getting a car, um, getting a, an Uber, sort of getting to the store, getting your groceries, being able to pay with your phone, um, being able to come back home. And just, I think I had a moment that was just like, I can't, this is the world that we live in now. Um, and I know that I seem quite young and you might think like, oh, I've, you know, I've always lived where we just had phones and had access to just like having things really quickly. But I mean, we were around for the time when uh, phones were sort of the button phones and, you know, you couldn't take pictures on all of that. And seeing that rapid change um, in our lifetime is, I think it was like, it just shook me. Um, but also I had a moment of thinking that that's not necessarily the reality for a lot of people on the continent, like that kind of access, that kind of ease of, you know, moving through, um, you know, just moving through the world with the convenience of being digitally connected isn't something that a lot of people have. And so how do we, how do we get there? I think the interest sparks 
is, is ignited by the question, how do we get there? How do we make this a reality for Africans everywhere, for people everywhere? Um, yeah, and thinking about it in very practical ways, basically. Um, I'm seeing a second question from Andrew. Mm -hmm. Um, how can people contribute to the development of digital economies in Africa without being in Africa? I think the best way is through the exchange of ideas. Um, off the top of my head, I think just, you know, being in conversation with people in Africa is one of the best ways. Not only does it, you know, sort of... Um, limit the possibility of you know people parachuting in right where you have for instance um not just non-africans but also you know diaspora who may not be familiar with the on the ground dynamics or the local the cultural dynamics and you know sort of coming back to africa and being like oh we have all these ideas and then not having been in conversation with the people who live there before that that's you know that's one of the things that you limit and you avoid but also to just, you know, I think the, the exchange of ideas is a really powerful thing. I think there's um, the ability to sort of have those conversations in real time as well because of the digital age, because of the power of the internet is something that's really powerful. Um, and you have, you have people who are in that space who can localize some of those ideas. Um, so that's, you know, you don't necessarily have to be physically in Africa. I think you just need to be plugged into Africa and plugged into people living in Africa. Um, I don't know if there's time for me to address the last question. Yes, please. You can go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, Arjuan has asked, how did you manage to get into two different fields and contribute them together into one aspect? Uh, Great question. <laughs> um, my, my approach has been that my interests are my own and I acknowledge the fact that whatever I do as part of my full-time job might not necessarily cater to all of those interests that I have. It might not um, feed all of those interests or plug into all of those interests. So what I would do is sort of create a space where I can continue to develop some of my personal intellectual curiosities. Um, so, you know, conversations about, you know, uh, the, digital, um, the digital economy, you know, young people, um, women's participation, democracies, and that sort of thing. Those are things that I know that I'm passionate about and that I'm interested in. And there might not be the space to sort of do all of that in a tangible way or in a very explicit way in what I do in my daytime. So I you know, through writing an, a, an opinion piece, for instance, writing for a newspaper, doing a little bit of research, um, sort of independent research, uh, submitting, uh, you know, short pieces to journals, to, um, to blogs. That's, you know, this is all part of sort of the sharing of ideas. And I think it's quite powerful that, you know, that's how Demaris basically found me. Um, we'd never met before, never seen each other, but because I have this footprint of having been plugged into these conversations, um, because I've published like a number of pieces on these issues, um, you immediately know who to connect to on the continent. And I think that's, if that's not, you know, the, the most explicit sort of testament of, you know, the, the power of the, the time that we live in. I don't, I don't know what is. So, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely it. Yeah, so, so it, it, yeah. it's, it, it's okay. I think you can go. We have about uh, seven to 10 minutes and then we okay. can move on to, to the next discussion. You, you, you have time to. Okay. To uh, sure. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, a follow-up from Philip, um, do you think advancing digital growth on the continent should be facilitated by political leadership, the private sector or educational initiatives? I think it should be all of the above. Um, I think political leadership have the, and I might be a little bit biased because I do feel like I'm a political animal at heart, but I think political leadership have the biggest of burden or of responsibility in terms of um, representing the needs and the interests of their constituencies. Their jobs are to represent their constituencies' best interests and 
to broker relationships that will make those a reality. It's not to say that, you know, we expect politicians to give us jobs, to give us these digital jobs that they're promising us, but it's to say that they know what, you know, people need. They know that um, this is the future. And so they have to sort of set, they have to set the tone. They have to invite um, the, the private sector to the table. They have to, in a sense, woo the private sector and convince them that this is a worthwhile um, thing for them to invest in. So they have, you know, they have to be quite proactive in that sense. And that's why I mentioned in the presentation, um, the proactiveness is sort of emerging slowly. Um, but at the same time, the private sector also has to respond to some of those challenges. Um, just a, a small example is, you know, the, the challenges in South Africa regarding broadband pricing. The price of data in South Africa is just, uh, I don't have a politically correct word to describe it, but it is, you know, it's unaffordable for the majority of the country. Um, the majority of the population is spending, you know, up to, um, I, I don't even want to pull out the, the sum in my head because I don't, I don't have the, the right one, but, and, you know, the burden of unaffordable data costs lies mostly on low income households or low income individuals. And so the private sector might think that, you know, their best interest or their order of, you know, business is to maximize profits, but they're still on social obligation in terms of, you know, meeting the needs of the country that they work in or of the population, of their consumers. Um, and so that's where, again, you know, regulation and the government need to find a middle ground to ensure that, you know, pricing is affordable, that pricing is equitable. So those are some of those linkages that, you know, a policy or a governance level can, can sort of coordinate. Um, the final question is, how do we um, ensure inclusive development in a digitalized environment and economy? How do we measure inclusive development? Big questions, uh, really good question. I think the um, inclusive development is still quite a contentious sort of, uh, idea in different social science spaces and different economic circles. Um, different people have different ideas of what inclusive development means. Does it mean uh, we should abandon economic growth and GDP and those sort of numerical metrics altogether? Do we look at, you know, quality of life? Do we look, there's all sorts of conversations about, you know, how do we measure this and how do we, how do we have a conversation about what's meaningful inclusive development? But I think there are some sort of low hanging fruits in terms of, you know, gauging whether what we're doing here is a, an ethical sort of project. Is this equitable? And I think one of the metrics is participation, right? Inclusion versus exclusion. How many people have access at the very basic level? How many people have affordable access? Um, how many people are able to make meaningful and sustainable livelihoods off of, um, you know, the digital space, it doesn't, it's not worth much if, um, you know, people are working online or, you know, everybody's driving Uber, but nobody's making enough for a living wage. If nobody has enough of a social safety net from those earnings. And so there's all of these different things to look at. And I think the, the main question right at the top is, um, what, what is a meaningful life? What is a, you know, a, a sort of um, an ethical standard for living and are people able to actualize this? Are people able to access this through the kind of access that they have to the internet as it stands? And once we have that answer, does that exist for a select few? Um, do those benefits and those opportunities exist for a select few? Is it just, you know, the startup and the tech junkies and, you know, the data scientists who can, you know, make up to 50 times what, you know, the average person makes in a country um and how do we standardize that how do we how do we equalize some of those those benefits um and that's also another conversation it could be through regulation it could be through sort of more incentives it could be through you know coaxing the private sector there's all sorts of ways that that conversation can pan out but that's i think that's the interesting thing about um sort of policy making, it's trying to find consensus and grappling with different different priorities. 
Right. I don't think there's any more questions. Am I seeing right, Google? Yes. Yes. All right. So thank you so much again. This has been wonderful. And that doesn't mean that you're done. Maybe somebody has a question. <laughs> Sure, Once of we, course. We had the next uh, presentation, but at this time, I want to welcome our next speaker, and that is Ari Bate. Ari is joining us from Cameroon. I briefly introduced him at the beginning, but Ari, please welcome. As we said, feel free to tell us more about yourself. There's so many things that uh, we didn't know about Russia until she introduced herself. So please welcome Ari. And uh, before Ari goes on, I just want to mention that uh, after Ari's talk, we're going to have uh, Ife. Ife is one of the com com students at Michigan State University and, and he's in the committee that plans this event. So he's going to take over after your talk. So if you don't see me speaking, Ife, please welcome after. So Ari, give it back to you. Thank you, Damaris. Uh... Hello everyone, and it's such a pleasure to be here. You guys, Google, thank you for sharing. I think that was quite insightful. And so um, I feel like you read my mind because when I was thinking of the kind of presentation to do, I went back watching all of the previous sessions and I was like, what kind of slides do I present? And um, yeah, I felt like we should get a kind of different approach. And so I'm going to share with you guys some of the things that I prepared, but hopefully that's important. But before then, I'm curious, um, whenever I'm doing, by the way, whenever I'm doing a presentation, um, I, like, I like the response. And so I might have to ask you guys to maybe respond to me sometime. But I'm curious, um, where are you attending from? Please just type in the chat. Maybe you might not be able to put on your video. Where are you attending from if you're... Just put the country. If you're attending from the U.S., please put the U.S. and then put the state. Just, I'm just curious to kind of know where you guys are, are here from. Let me let me pull up the chat. Chicago, awesome. Okay. Oh, Michigan. Okay. Yeah, Michigan in the building. Johannesburg, South Africa, Ghana. Okay. All right. Maine, am I pronouncing that correctly? Lansing, okay, Michigan. Okay, awesome. Good to see you guys and good to speak. Nigeria, Nigeria and the building, Omo. <laughs> okay, uh, but I'm happy that we have quite um, a very diverse um, set of people here. And so um, I should have loved to introduce my friend, myself, Okay, from Togo. Someone says from Togo. Awesome. Good to have you here. So I should have loved to introduce myself, but again, the presentation um, is going to share a little bit about me because I felt like we should also take some different approach and specifically because we were talking about Cameroon. I was like, why don't I share my experience back from Cameroon as the best way to introduce to you what I'm about to say? Okay, one last question. Um, what do you do just so I can have the demographics? If you're a student, just write the word student. If you're, um, if you're working or if you're running your business, please write um, the industry where you are. Student, student, awesome, okay. Student, awesome, okay, right. Professor, oh shit, I have to, I have to be careful. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me share my screen, guys. Uh, yeah, but we're going to have a very interesting ride and happy to have you all here. Humphrey Fellow. Okay. Right. I hope you all can see my screen right now. First, but let me pull up my chat so that... Um, I can't be able to see the charts and see what you guys are saying as well. Okay. So I figured out the best way, right? I'm going to be talking about the evolution growth power of digitalization in, in Cameroon. So specifically Cameroon. But again, um, I figured out the, the best way to be able to pass across the message I want to share and just to share from the perspective of how um, the digital activities in Cameroon have evolved, how they have been able to grow and the impact. 
Um, it's, I mean, I, I figured out the best way would be to share my experience and my story and some of the things I have been doing back there and how it has evolved and then vis-a-vis -vis what is happening. And so um, this presentation, first, let me just give you guys some background on Cameroon. This is just some quick stats, um, just so that you have an idea. Cameroon's total population is 26.55 million people. And of that 26.55 million people, we have 915, sorry, we have 9.15 million people who are active on the internet. Um, that's according to data reporter in a, a report that was published in January, 2021. And so um, to further give you, please follow me. I might be um, speaking very fast because I also have some things that I want to share. And I want to make sure that I, I share most of this, but it's going to be interesting. Um, so we have 10 regions, eight of these 10 regions are French speaking and then two are English speaking. And as a result, we also have two official languages French and English. And then we have 200, more than 250 ethnic languages, which we actually uh, speak just like um, America will have different states and different people will communicate differently. We have 250 ethnic languages. And so this presentation, I want to really, really focus on three particular aspects. So the first is going to be, the first side of it is kind of going to be uh, from the internet as a tool for employment in Cameroon. And then um, the second side of it from the current digital ventures that are operating in Cameroon, maybe some of those things that are happening and how we are doing things differently. And then the third part of it is going to be the rise of an allied class and activist. Um, in Cameroon, especially on the internet, which is our focus. And so um, is that okay with you guys if I kind of shared with you a backstory? I see someone. I see someone uh, sharing something. It looks like your connection, is it that strong? You may want to close some pages of programs that may be running your system. Okay. Oh, that's a private message, guys. Okay. Someone saying my connection is not very strong. Let me see if I could close some pages. Oh. Can any can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, really I just got a message. Someone says my connection is not very strong. So maybe I could close some of my pages and programs that are running on the background. But please, if you can hear, hear me clearly, just put type the word clearly in the chat so I know you're getting me 515. Okay, clear. All right. Okay, majority of you guys can hear me clear. Okay, I'll just I'll just kick off from there. All right. If that's okay with you guys, let me share a little bit of my backstory and some of the things that we um, I have been doing. So. This mean 2017, um, I remember I was in my second year of the university. I had just, um, I was studying journalism and mass communication. And so at this point, I was actually volunteering for a radio station. And then one of these days, I sit down and I'm asking myself, um, you know that moment when you're in school and then towards the end of it, I was in my second year. And then towards the end of it, you're like, the reality hits you that you might not have to return to your parents' home. And so it was kind of a reality to me. And I was asking myself, okay, so from this point, what do I do? And what's the next, um, the next years of my life going to look like? And so I decided at this point, okay, I was going to start volunteering for some um, newspapers or for some media organs out there to get some experience, even while I was in the university. So I sat down, I remember that they sat down, um, wrote to some newspapers or wrote to some uh, media organs and say, hey, my name is Array. I'm based in Boya, Cameroon, and I came over your uh, newspaper, but I thought it would be a very good opportunity for me to volunteer and for me to work for your organization. Yet again, guys, please, I want you to follow me because I'm trying to carry you along on a very small journey. And uh, all this is going to make sense deep down in the conversation as we go through. And so it kind of happens that I started working for some newspapers. And then when I got some of that experience, I told myself, okay, um, I remember one of the jobs that I actually had was writing for a magazine. And so when we started write, when I started writing for the magazine, we published once every, every month. And so one day I said to myself, I, I started thinking to myself, I was like, okay, 
if we publish once every month, how could I do with all the other news information that I get on a daily basis? And so I came up with a little idea to start writing something which I called News Array, which was after my name. And so I said, um, it was um, News Array was kind of something that I wrote and sent to Facebook and WhatsApp groups. So at the end of every day, um, since I was studying journalism, I was, I was actually gathering every news updates and headlines. Sometimes you just have like a headline, just two lines, but I'll write about five of those headlines. And then I forward to WhatsApp groups. I created a broadcast list and also shared to those, uh, to the WhatsApp group, to Facebook groups where I was. And that was kind of a journey, but I didn't know how it was going to kick off from there. So during the day or during the week, I'll share news array. And then at the end of the month, I was working for the magazine. And then later on, I got some really good and interesting uh, feedback from what I was doing. And so I started asking, I started saying to myself, oh my God, people are relating to this. So sometimes I'll share those new up news updates and then people started uh, kind of say, hey, thanks Array, we rely on your updates and everything. And so it was kind of a big realization for me. And even the days when I didn't write, I remember some people would write to me and say, hey Array, no news updates today. And so I was like, why don't I just take this to a uh, blogging platform? I went on WordPress, created a free blogging platform. Uh, I actually named it, I don't know, I read it on wordpress.com and then started sharing updates. And I wrote on that website for about, I think for about five months. And then still in that 2017, one time I was like, okay, I need to take blogging professional. Let me go professional. And so I went on created where I uh, got someone to, to, to design and create a website for me. We sat down, did everything. And that's how I started my blogging platform, um, rab.com. And so it was like, I'm blogging, but again, that's me doing my digital journalism. And so I started writing and with uh, my uh, news website, what we did is I focused on reporting uh, politics, press freedom, and um, social stories, human interests, and just many of those. But I didn't do like the entertainment. I wanted to niche down. So I found a niche in politics. And again, I had loved politics. I'd always been reporting politics. And so that was the start of rb.com and how I continued taking my blogging platform to that level. And so we wrote politics, press freedom, human rights stories, um, social stories, and we started publishing. And then this is how it happens. Around six months after we keep writing, and then uh, I, I said we like I had been many, but by that time it was steamy. So I kept writing. And then at some point, when I started getting around 3,000 to 50,000 monthly visits, every uh, monthly visits, I was like, how do I make some money from this? So I put together a small team and I'm like, hey guys, um, I've been running a platform. This is what's happening. Uh, when I publish stories, I get 30 to 50,000 monthly views. And I sat down, wrote something like a partnership letter or something and sent the team out and say, hey, go and approach these businesses. Let's see who can be able to come and advertise with us so that they can take space for some banner ads. And just, uh, that was the beginning of me trying to build a business at that point, although I was quite uh, very ignorant. I didn't much, know much about it, but it stemmed from the desire of me just wanting to um, publish news daily, to building a blogging platform, to gathering the audience, and then uh, also learning, okay, how do I now make a living from this? Or how do I at least make sure that the time that I put into this, I get some small monies from it. So we went out, started approaching people and it went pretty well because we had a few people and then we ran into a problem. Now, what was the problem? The first problem is that um, Google Ads in Cameroon is slow. For those of you who are on call here, who might have a little, um, for those of you who have a little knowledge about Google Ads, what happens with Google Ads is that we have, anyway, I'm going to talk about this down the line again, but just to give you an idea, Google Ads, Google Ads has something they call the PPC, which is pay-per-click. And pay-per-click is uh, when you start a website, right? You, you apply to Google and then they'll give you a, a specific link. You're going to put it at the back end of your website. And if anyone visits your website, you're going to see ads. So when your readers click on these ads, it is called pay-per-click because Google is going to pay you per click, which you get on that link, right? And so when Google pays you per click, but here's the inter interesting thing about Google ads that they are going to pay you based on the location where the person clicks from. That's a problem to me because I am in Cameroon. The people rate is like, um, I, I, like it's like 
two cents per click where in other countries now just to put that into perspective it means that if you're reading uh let's say you're reading a new story on a website and you're in the us and then you click a link google might pay the person up to or the person who has the website or who has the google ads installed on their website up to around 50 cents but down in cameroon we might be able to, I, the same click might give me just about two cents five cents or 20 cents and so the big problem was I couldn't monetize that because even based on the readership, and again, just to give you further knowledge into that, sometimes just around 0.5% of the people who visit your website are actually going to click on those ads. So that was a big problem to me. The first, the second problem was there was no predictability from the audience. So when we reached out to these businesses and told them, hey, I want to advertise, uh, I want you to take a banner ad on our website, we couldn't be able to predict to them and tell them, um, hey, you're going to get five people buy this product you're going to get 10 people buy this product because they have seen it on our website now the next problem we had again was that year the anglophone crisis started in cameroon i had to drop out from school and here's how this affected it with the anglophone crisis we started having um i mean with the internet uh, with the, the anglophone crisis we started ha having some shootings um, like real world, to be honest with you, for those of you who might have read the Cameroon Anglophone crisis, it was a point where sometimes you get up during the day and then there, there are gunshots, you can't go out, businesses are shut down. And so that was one point for me. I was like, oh my God, where do I start to focus? Where do I move from here? Because even the businesses that used to advertise on our platform could no longer do that. Right. And so that was the next, pro that was a really big problem for me. And uh, the Anglophone crisis also came with an internet shutdown. And so I started thinking to myself, I remember that year when I dropped out from school, I nearly went crazy because I was also at the verge of leaving my magazine job. But again, I still did not have something that could be able to give me a steady, um, steady finance every month. And so I started thinking and asking myself, how do I innovate the business? But I'm sharing all this because it's going to make sense down the line when we start to talk about the different streams of income online or the digital streams of income in Cameroon. So please um, follow me. And by the way, please, if you're following, please, I want you to type on the chats, uh, just type the word following so I can know that you guys are following me. So we had uh, to bring out, we had to come with a small solution. Now, one of the first solutions, awesome. I see you guys writing following. Thank you. Now, one of the first solutions that I thought of coming up with was, okay, because we cannot have, good, good. Thank you guys for, for writing. Because we cannot have predictions to these business owners and tell them, okay, this is how many sales or how many people are going to buy from our website, when you put a banner ad, I said to myself, two things, we were going to do two things. The, second, the, the first thing was to start doing social media promotion. So not just were we going to start posting about news on our Facebook pages, on our Facebook page, I was like, if we also have someone who wants to advertise, we're also going to post about them on the Facebook page. And then the second thing was also extending a hand now to these businesses and saying, not just do I want you to come and advertise or put a banner ad on my website, let me be able to manage your Facebook pages. And then uh, every month I'm going to create content. I'm going to write about your business because I'm an expert in writing. I will try to read about your business, see your goals and see the products that you're selling at that time. And then I will create some content around what you're selling and I'll manage your social media and you give me a small commission every month. And so I reached out to a few businesses and that was me trying to get into the process of pivoting my business, right? And so we did that. And then the second thing we did was um, that I wanted to do was diversify into real social media marketing. So I didn't just want to get in that, uh, get stuck in that loop of, okay, come and advertise. And if 10 people see your things, that's fine. Right, I see some people putting questions already. Don't worry, I'm coming back to those questions. And so I started having, I, I was like, let me not just get in the, in the loop, let me not get stuck in the loop of saying, just come and advertise. But I wanted to go further to say, if you advertise, this is how I can at least predict the number of people that are going to come to you. And so I got into social media marketing full-time. 
anyway, it's not like I really just got into social media marketing, but I started studying at that time. So it's not like I got into it the very next moment, but I went out there, started uh, maybe buying courses or reading more about it and then schooling myself just so that I have more idea about what I was doing. And so a few months later, I founded arabismarketing.com, which is actually a social media marketing agency. And I added this as part of my services. And so to myself, I was on one part running a news platform which was still my passion because I'm passionate about politics. And uh, but to me, guys, one of my most important things that I hold close to my heart is using my media as a, true, as a tool to check the excesses of the government and speak up against power, which is very, very important to me because like a kid who came from Cameroon, who has witnessed gunshots, who has witnessed people being shot, who has witnessed the inequalities in the communities, I felt if I was given that kind of... Um, a talent or that kind of, a, of an opportunity, I had to use my platform to speak against, um, I mean, injustice or to speak truth to power, especially as I studied journalism. So one side of it was me communicating and writing on my blogging platform. And then the other side of it was Arabi's marketing, which I now focus down on running a social media marketing agency. We provide Facebook ads, Instagram ads, um, sales funnels, and then email marketing. And so that's what we did. Um, started up RB Media full time. And in 2018, I kind of went full time because I wanted to do everything to make sure that um, I could kind of leave off the things that I had been doing. So somewhere around 2018, I did all I could do. And then I started focusing full time on my platform, RB Media, which I've been running since 2018, right up to now. But here's the interesting part of it. Now, all of that now, because I started doing so many other politics and other things, I kind of got involved into many other things and growing myself. And over the years, um, around 2018, I remember during the Cameroon president presidential election, I said to myself, because I have some priorities in politics, I sat down and then took the names of these presidential candidates I was like, I wanted to work with at least one of them so badly. I remember writing to around five of the presidential candidates, got turned down, uh, got, yes, I was turned down by some of them. And then fortunately for me, um, when I sent Barista Karemuna a message, she was like, okay, son, come in. And that's how it happened. I went over, both stayed at the headquarters and also ran some of his, some part of his online campaigns in the 2018 presidential campaigns and the presidential elections. So this is a picture of myself and Barista Karem Muna. But again, all of this is going to make sense down the drain as we start to talk about the different facets uh, of the digital activities in Cameroon. And so some part of it um, later on got listed among the British Council's top 100 young journalists worldwide and um, also among the top 100 young leaders at the Global Leadership Challenge by Oxford University and St. Gallen Symposium. And also at some point, I became very passionate about building a community. And so I founded, I became very passionate about building a community. And so I founded a community called AB Africpreneur, which is for career starters and entrepreneurs. So what we do, we try to help them to link entrepreneurs together. And it came from an idea of me trying to meet one of my mentors for over three years and I could not. And so when I finally met him, that was an inspiration for me. It was like, what if I created a community where we could be able to bring entrepreneurs and career starters together? This is a, a, actually a picture of our 20... 20 edition of the AB Africpreneur event in Cameroon. Now, if you have been following right up to this point, that kind of leads me to the second part of this presentation. If you have been following right up to, right up to this point, you probably hear me talk about some of the different streams of income and maybe some of the different digital activities that are going on in Cameroon. I've probably talked about blogging. I've talked about me getting into social media marketing, and I've talked about me actually getting into content creation. And so these are some of the streams of income that I actually found in Cameroon. So we have blogging, but with blogging, it's kind of done in a very, very peculiar way, because like I explained further, the PPC, which is pay per click in Cameroon is quite low. So when when people tend to do blogging, the natural tendency is for them to also combine their activities of blogging with things like uh, promotions. Um, when I talk about promotions, it's like talking to businesses, to artists, depending on your niche. If you're in the fashion brand, you speak to brands and then you start to promote their products. Uh, also, you could ask for you could ask businesses to get banner ads on your website, or sometimes you strike business uh, partnerships and then content creation. 
And in most cases, I would say that in Cameroon, blogging is closely related to PR, especially on social media, public relations, just because uh, bloggers, I would say, I always say that blog, blogging is like a very good field because it gives you a good idea of almost everything. You know how to communicate, you know how to write, you at least know how to manage a team when you start getting a team. And so uh, bloggers also with that communication skill tend to do some public relations. And then because of the fact that they manage blogging platforms on social media, they'll often reach out to businesses like I did or to brands or to artists or to influencers and public figures and say, hey, um, I'm blogging, but as well, I could manage your social media. And so that's how blogging, that's kind of the turn of blogging in Cameroon. And those are some of the things we do. Now with YouTube, it's also a very similar because we have like the PPC, like I said, the paper clicks. And so when someone gets into YouTube in Cameroon, you often see them either uh, putting their Google ads or the struggle to sign brand deals. Um, as a YouTuber, or maybe not necessarily signing as a brand ambassador, but also speaking, uh, talking to these businesses and also um, do creating specific videos about these businesses on their platforms. And then in many cases, YouTubers are going to work uh, with events. They'll advertise some of their events. They'll work with businesses and also they'll work with artists to be able to help artists. When artists do their recent releases, they'll help them to be able to increase their views and to make sure that they get a wider range. So that's actually one of the one of the things that uh, would often do in Cameroon, but with a kind of different twist to it. Now we also have a really rising group of comedians, um, and this is across Africa and the world as well. But in Cameroon, it's uh, I would say that it is at its best form right now. We have comedians who have millions of views, and because of that, they will often use this as a specific. Um, some of them have, I, I mean, quite honestly, some of them are making a full flesh living from it. So they often incorporate ads into it, and so when you start getting about. 200,000 views, you, you speak out to brands out there and say, hey, um, I could be able to mention some of your brands in between maybe in between my videos at the, at the six minute or at the second minute. And I'll talk about your brand and you be a sponsor for my channel or you be a sponsor for my skits right uh, for a specific period of time and then sometimes there is the influencer marketing influencer marketing is very similar to the ads but influencer marketing it's more of i use my image for example when i got into blogging in 2018 um i wrote to icm which was an educational institution in cameroon and said hey because i i i I first was using my name, Are, Are Bate, like Are B. So I wrote to the team and said, hey, I wanted to become the brand ambassador. They did a few checks, fought them back, and then I became the brand ambassador in 2018, which was kind of influencer marketing that I incorporated to my blogging platform. And that kind of leads to brand ambassadors. So influencer marketing and brand ambassadors are very, very similar things. Um, Google said something very important, a very important question when she was talking about revenue. She said, everyone is asking how much can we make? And I feel like that's the question um, that I'm struggling to explain here for most of this, because um, at the end of the day, when we talk about digital ventures, uh, ventures, we're trying to talk about how much you make from it or what's the feasibility of you actually making a living from it. And then um, I'll also categorize this into uh, digital entrepreneurship. So we the rise of digital entrepreneurs. Yeah, we have digital entrepreneurs in Cameroon in different facets. Some of them are focused on web development, building websites, mobile apps. And then we have the social media marketing, which is what I incorporated into my business as Arabi's marketing. And then we have tech fashion brands. This is actually very interesting because we have a thing in Cameroon where, and I know this is very popular almost everywhere, but someone can actually start like a fashion brand without necessarily owning, owning a storehouse. I remember one of these ladies um, I, I kind of spoke to, she had a fashion brand, but she didn't have a storehouse. So what she did was she'd go to the market, take pictures of these very good shoes that she knew that ladies were very interested about, take images of them and then get them on her status. Maybe these shoes could be selling at, let's say 15,000 francs, which is around $30. And then she put them on her status and say, hey, new in stock. I just got this, this is 50,000. This is, you can get this now for 50,000 francs. That should double the price to around $60. And then when someone gets, so one of the things we did with her was um, when she put those pictures on her status, when someone 
places the order we told I, I told her i was like you don't have to sell immediately ask them to do an advance so when they do an advance she will simply just get about five of those orders and then go to the, to the shop where the shoes are and she'll come and deliver and they, they'll give her money so at that point she was building a fashion brand but not necessarily even owning the products or even um kind of having a warehouse or something so it became a form of entrepreneurship because right up to on today that's her business but by the way she has a, a warehouse now where she have some products but it started with her just making use of the other shops that were around so um still as part of digital entrepreneurship i uh, will have people that will come up like graphic designers these are not necessarily people who are supposed to have an office for example i do not have an office i have a team of four we work from anywhere where we are and that's that's how we have been working the past four years. I do not intend to get an office, quite honestly, because I feel like it's more expenditure for me. So if I have a team, but most of this, and the best thing is that you could sit here, like from this chair, I'll do most, I'll have most of my meetings, I'll have most of my work, and I'll get my stuff done, which to me is also a very good thing and the freedom of running a business. And then still under this category, I'll kind of put video editors. I know that my time is up, so I'm rounding up. It's very fast. And then we have um, the rise of an airline. Now, this is the third part of it. This is the very last part. I'll just talk about this and then we get to questions. The rise of an airline class uh, and activist in Cameroon. This is a very important, um, I'll say this is a segment that's very close to my heart because I think I witnessed this from at least from the moment when it, when it took its rise and uh, started with the internet court in Cameroon. Now, just to give you an idea, in 2017 or 2016, we had the Cameroon Anglophone crisis. For those of you who might not have an idea of what the Cameroon Anglophone crisis is, we have eight French speaking regions and then two English speaking regions. So the English speaking regions, which are the minority, they raise up against the French speaking regions and said they were being marginalized in two main aspects, the system of education, and the, uh, the court laws. And so in 2016, teachers and lawyers in the English speaking regions took to the street and started protesting. And then when the government met these teachers and lawyers, when their actions were met with like um, sending the military on them to beat them, that culminated into an entire crisis, which is today known as the Cameroon Anglophone crisis. And so because of this prolonged crisis, there is always like the strikes, the constant strikes, sometimes there's the shooting. And right now it has gotten to the part where we actually have a group of people who are raising up against the government and they are saying, we no longer want to cohabitate or to live together with you. We want to secede. They are now called the secessionists. Long story short, because of the constant fighting and because, this, uh, because social media played such an important role in the Anglophone crisis, especially at the start, the government decided to cut internet from the Anglophone regions. Now, it was 230 days and it is recorded to be uh, Africa's longest internet shutdown. So the first 94 days ran from uh, the government cut internet from January 17th. 2017 to April 20, 2017. And then the second internet cut down was done from October 2017 to uh, March 2018. I think I'll stop sharing at this point so that I could easily um, talk about this. So we had two internet shutdowns. Now, what happened with the internet shutdowns? When the government cut uh, internet in these regions, I remember at that time, even I was uh, kind of working for a newspaper and one of the stress I really had, guys, you can imagine this, that if you had to send in a story to the editor, I would kind of call the editor on the phone, on a regular call, and then we dictate the stories and they're going to copy or they're going to type where they are. And then I remember even that time we were working on, uh, I was working on a radio documentary. And so the lady who really had a good voice and I wanted her to do the voiceover, we couldn't send information through WhatsApp, no WhatsApp, no Facebook, no emails, nothing. And you're just there. And so I actually wrote down the script, right? Typed it on my laptop, put it in a flash drive. I went to the bus station put it in an envelope, packaged everything, sent to her in another town. And when she received it, she recorded it, put in another flash drive, went back to the bus station and then sent to me. And then we had to edit and do all of that. And so 
all of this was kind of one big moment when I when I started sharing about um, the problems that we that we faced. But that was to kind of say that this led to the rise of a group of really determined people and youths who wanted to be able to use social media to speak up. And most importantly, it's important to note that most of the activists were those who are, are still are those who are based abroad. That's because uh, for some reason, our government wouldn't allow you to speak freely when you're in Cameroon. I mean, um, you guys, I don't have to tell you guys about it, but uh, <laughs> this is something you probably know. But most of our governments, they wouldn't allow you to speak freely. So the rise of an... Um, Allied group, I would say that they are mostly, they rotate mostly around four categories of people who are using the internet to speak up against government and to also portray their ideas. We have journalists, we have activists, and then we have politicians. And to some lesser extent, we have thought leaders, like a few entrepreneurs who are actually speaking up. But this kind of led to the group, uh, to the rise of a group of people, and they're using mainly Twitter, just like Nigeria uses Twitter. We use Twitter and Facebook, which is our main way of passing our across um, aggrievances, videos, images, text, and all of that stuff, passing it across to the internet. So that, my friend, is the landscape of digital activities in Cameroon. And um, it's so broad, I can't finish everything I really have to say, but because I know that I'm short of time, I'll probably just have to take some of your questions. And hopefully this helps you to give, to get a greater insight of what's happening in our digital space back in Cameroon. Wow. This looks like a transition, really, like we moved from uh, talking about policies and the national broader level of this uh, digital space, digital economy um, ideas. And now we've narrowed it down to Ari, who is actually doing, engaged in, in, in the space as an entrepreneur himself. So. Initially, I introduced Ife that uh, was going to continue the discussion, but I'm going to introduce Emmanuel now. Emmanuel, please welcome. He's also a graduate student here at Michigan State University, and he's also uh, among the planning team and the president of the student organization that works with the African Studies Center in hosting this event. And uh, Emmanuel, I'll, I'll welcome you to please go ahead and lead the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Damaris. Um, thank you, Ari, for that very insightful presentation. You really took us through your journey and where you are at at this point. Um, I initially had a question about something you shared at the beginning, but I'll start from where you stopped and we can work backwards. Uh, my question to you is, would you consider yourself a social entrepreneur in, in light of what you just shared, how your uh, engagement with the digital space also has impact for some of the things happening in the social space, like what you just narrated about how you had to navigate the challenges of the internet shutdown. That's an interesting question because I think it's one of the things I've always fought with uh, on how to name myself or call myself. Um, as with entrepreneurship, sometimes you need to wear different hats. For example, now I'm doing a speaking engagement and sometimes I'm, I'm going back, I have to uh, maybe kind of lead my team and other times do different, do different things. Um, I'd like to just refer to myself as an internet entrepreneur, but sometimes the duty will, will, will require you to get into different aspects of it. Um, I've never thought of calling myself a social entrepreneur. Some people introduce me and say, but I just like to call it internet entrepreneur and then maybe a different times where duty calls you have to serve if you have that experience you do that that i think that's what i would say am i frozen manu is frozen I okay guess. uh ari yep ip address uh professor if you only know, i don't have that question yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i didn't get your your, la your last statement emmanuel oh. i think you were frozen for about 10 seconds Oh, 15. Oh, right. Uh, I was saying there's a question about um, the incentives that you get from advertising. If someone changes their ISP address, how is that um, handled? Do you still get compensated? So what happens is when you are blogging, right, when you're doing blogging, it I think your location can instead positively affect um, the incentives you get. For example, 
Um, I noticed that when I'm in the UK, um, according to algorithms, Google would most likely show my content to, although I still publish on my website, but because my IP address now shows the UK, Google will most likely show most of my articles to people in the UK. Hence, good clicks for me. You get the point. So um, it not necessarily affects your income per se that you have changed your location, but it's good in that the suggestions come from um, your IP, those around your IP. But I have to mention this, um, this I think I left this out in the presentation. Niche matters a lot. I think I left, I left this out, this, and this is so important. When you're publishing on the internet, for example, I'll be honest with you, I make less more money or even less incentives than I should make because I am focused on politics in Cameroon. And my politics is just for people who are in Cameroon. Like not just every random person on the internet will click and read something about Cameroon. But my friends who might be writing about, for example, let's say something like love, fashion, they would get way clicks and they would read it to anyone. They'll get way many clicks and anyone around the world can be able to follow that content. But because I decided to niche down, again, that's because it is my passion and politics in my country. So that's kind of the balance. But when you're in a country, you get suggestions from that country. And then still, if people read from your own country, you have the position of benefiting from the two sides. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Awesome. I invite anyone else to uh, chime in and engage with RA. Uh, feel free to post your question or ask it in real time. Uh, there was a question here. I don't know. It actually, feels like it's been answered somehow from Philip. Okay. Supposedly, I reside in Nigeria, but situated myself electronically in France. How much do I get for my clicks? So I think that's kind of very similar to what I shared. Mm -hmm. So your clicks is going to depend on where they come from. If I send you a link to a story and I am in Cameroon and you are in the US, if you read and you click from the US um, for some reason uh, or based on factors like um, the high income, uh, high income countries, Google has ranked most of those countries on the top tier. So like I think Canada, US, um, Canada, US, UK, there are some of those really top tier countries where a single click would give you 50 cents and above. Meanwhile, if somebody clicks from Cameroon, some other countries, India, it might give you a lesser click. So what matters is just where you get your clicks from. It's not That's why we even have bloggers in Cameroon who are based in Cameroon but their blogs are more popular in the US because they have content. For example, I have a friend who teaches, she teaches bloggers how to blog and she's more famous in the US even than in Cameroon. And so she gets way higher clicks and she'll make, she'll make thousands of dollars every month. Um, it's just, do you guys know that meme? There's a meme where that guy, that guy was like. <laughs> <laughs> Has that strategy yeah. led you to mobilize people, engage with your content in those high income? Uh, places come again that realization that the clicks matter more than the ip address has that led you to mobilize people who can then engage with your content in those countries yeah i think i was a little limited just based on my content again it's just from cameroon and that's the more reason why i kind of switched or added the, uh, social media marketing into my services so i could see anywhere I am and then pitch clients. For example, I'm currently working with some clients in the US. I'm working with some clients back in Cameroon, but um, that's like the other part of the business because of the realization that my political niche could not require me to scale for, for outside of Cameroon. So again, it's part of just being innovative as someone in the online space and finding how to fit. So, so I remember, Emmanuel, can I just comment yes, a little? I remember some, somebody, when Google was talking, somebody asked, like, how, how can uh, people outside Africa contribute to, yeah. to these um, digital economies? I perhaps think that in the most basic level, that's one way, you know? Right. If you, if I do that, but I didn't know that it meant anything. I mean, I knew, um, um, for example, I could be a, a follower, I could be a 
subscriber, mm -hmm. but I just didn't know that there, there those scales or weights in terms of uh, where you are. So that's good to know. Yeah, it, it does matter a lot. And um, even more, I think it is around the environment where you are. Uh, because sometimes where you are is going to influence the people you meet and the people you connect with. And it, it, it has a big part to play in your mindset and the way you do things. Um, I'd say maybe the reason for my little success is also because although I was based in Cameroon, I started stepping out and maybe meeting people out and connecting with people or buying stuffs from people in the US and elsewhere just to um, have that broader uh, mindset. So the good thing with the internet is that you 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 do your stuff from anywhere. It might take a while to figure it out because as with anything, you need it, you need some time to to get your hands wet with the work. But um, if you figure it out from where you are, gradually you keep building your audience. I didn't get thirty thousand visits. I mean, I've just passed over it in a presentation in two seconds, but I didn't get it in even in the first month. Not even in the first six months. It took me a while consistently publishing. I actually, sorry. I know this is getting long, but actually when I started, I, I told myself uh, it was a challenge that I gave myself that I was going to publish 1,000 articles for the next 1,000 days, In right? So I didn't necessarily keep to the promise all this, those days, but I published more than 1,000 articles to be able to at least get that audience. And so some point when I published some stories, I would get 100 uh, views some stories i got 1000 something views but that kept building the brand because every day you're showing up on people's faces and every day the more you're writing you're getting the experience you're knowing what works some things do not work you get the experience and all of that kind of gives you um the level of exposure and the level of understanding to focus more and where to put in the foil to put in more foil thank you so much i have very Sorry, I have very basic questions to ask about YouTubing and when do you start getting paid? It's just stories that I hear out here, but I'll let everybody else contribute before. If you have time, then we can go to those. Yeah, I see a question. Let me see. Has there be, let me see, has there been any legal word? I'm trying to read through the questions. Has there been... Be, has there been a sustained effort to legally protect Cameroonians from internet shutdowns? I'm sorry, no. Google, that's a very good question. And I think that's because, and I say it even on my social media, where with Cameroon, we, we have a really, it's a dictatorship. I mean, you, you can say all of it. I've had several times where I've published an article. I, I, one of the instances I published an article and I had a senator call me and say, hey, young man, are you sure about what you just wrote? You know what I mean? So sometimes I, I used to share this with my friends. I'm writing a political article and my hands are soaking wet and I'm panicking. Not because that's not the truth, but because I understand what can happen if I put out those messages. I know that if they do like this, I'd probably just people would just be writing about me and waving on social media. And so, um, no, there's not, there's not been any effort, meaning if the government decides to take us out next week, they will do it. And the most that we would have is motions of support. So there's another question in the chat from uh, Trevor, is it? That reads, uh, given the high rate of unemployment in Africa and the inability of government to engage unemployed graduates, do you train and encourage youth to take this as a career path? Um, yeah, Tebe, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, by the way. Yes, I do. Uh, when it's most, it's most importantly, when I find the chance. But also, like a young person, I also have to constantly put myself down and because it gets to a point where because you start getting some success sometimes it might get into your head and you start feel like you're very ready to start teaching i did this when i started but also i have to sit down and say okay you have to learn more so once in a while i'll put up trainings for example in 2019 i actually did a tour around cameroon um, the rb media tour we had seven conferences in 
seven cities in Cameroon where I just went around and then trained um, um, entrepreneurs or whoever was attending on the right use of social media and how to be able to use social media to grow their business. That was like an, it was like the RV media tour. I did it across Cameroon. So I would often put that or also I'd re, I, I wrote a book about it. I often do those adventures and also put out those events. But also, Teve, just to answer you, I do it consciously because sometimes you might get in the loop of also thinking that you're already there in such a way that you stop growing and you stop learning. So I try to strike a balance. So once in a while, I'll put up a masterclass, share some of the things I've had, and then I go, get back into my shell and try to learn um, and just grow more. Yo, I'm reading. Okay. Thanks for your presentation, Ravi. Do you have any thoughts on the metaverse or virtual, or virtual reality social platforms in relation to the future development of digital economy in African countries? This is such an interesting question, but I'm going to be very honest with you. I've heard of the metaverse, I've checked it out, but I'm not an expert. I don't think I will be the good person to speak on it just because I'm still trying it out. And um, hopefully I have some things to say about it in the future. Have I missed any question? My only problem is I don't like how Cameroon treats Nigeria on the social pitch. Oh, Mr. Philip, on behalf of all Cameroonians, I have come here to say that we want to make peace and we are fine with our neighbors. <laughs> and football has its way. Sometimes we might not, we might have those moments of, um, uh, those moments of struggle, but I think that Cameroon and Nigerians, we have a very good relationship still. And so if Cameroonians, if Nigerians fell hurt, I, on behalf of Cameroon, I have come here to solve the problem. <laughs> I'm curious, do you put out your content in both English and French, or do you also use any of the local languages? Or is it predominantly I'm very, English? I'm very bad in French. So what I do is... Um, Personally, for my personal brand, I put out content solely in English. That's because I'm not very good in French. But with the marketing agency, we're working with some clients who are in the French-speaking regions. So, so many times we will need to translate their ads uh, and the ad copies into French. So I got someone who helps with the translations when we have to do that. But for me, um, after bonjour, I might be stuck. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, I, I learn. Right. You mentioned there are over 250 um, local languages. Do you use any of them in your Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. My local language. So my local language is called Bayangi, B-A-N-Y-A-N-G-I. So um, I always brag and say it's the best language in Cameroon, but that's not a topic for today. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, I do. So I'm further curious, with English um, being used predominantly in two of the 10 regions you mentioned, the mm -hmm. followership that you have, do you know if it's from mostly the Francophone side that are bilingual, or is it within the English region, those 30 to 50,000 views? Or also, is it uh, outside of Cameroon? Is there a significant amount of viewership from your content? Right. So interestingly, when I pull up my stats, I, I look for... Um, the stats, especially the one in 2017, I couldn't say I wanted to add to the presentation. So when I checked it out, I have a very huge following from the English speaking regions. And then, so my first following is from Cameroon, the English speaking regions. And then I have uh, a following from the US. And then for me, my third following is from Nigeria. Interestingly, I have, it, it, that's why I said we and Nigerians are very, <laughs> Are very good guys and then some from UK and from everywhere but I think I'd say that at least 65% to 70% of my audience is back in Cameroon and also because I, I write politics or that's where I started building my base going to school studying all my stuff so based in Cameroon. Gotcha sounds like you pretty much engage in journalism um, would you say that's true despite your training being um, I do okay 
So I actually have a degree in journalism and mass communication. And then I always say that I'm a self-trained marketer. Um, so those are the two things I, com I, I combine, but my, my education is in journalism. But because I couldn't work full-time for a media organ, that's mm -hmm. why I still publish on my platform. And most importantly, because I, I feel it's a very good opportunity for me to use my platform to speak truth to power and also not being censored by people who are getting peanuts from the government. So it helps me to control my content, to be responsible for what I put out. Again, it comes with some certain level of responsibility of having to check yourself and also um, get keep for yourself. But journalism, marketing, and then on the side, building the community, those are things that I often do. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Um, we still have a little bit of time, not a whole lot, but a little bit. I'd like yeah. to invite any more comments and questions, give um, our audience the opportunity to engage with you if they have any lingering thoughts um, before we start wrapping up. Keep it coming, guys. We have a few minutes. Okay. Uh, if nobody's going, oh, I can show my camera for sure. So, so Ari, as I said, I'm just now going down to the roots and basics and asking. Um, it, it, it's what I hear. I'm, I'm not an expert in this space, definitely. And uh, in terms of um, benefiting, let's say you're a YouTuber, when would you expect to get some returns? And how? what's the consistency? So for example, you share content once in a while or versus sharing it consistently. So what can you advise, for example, somebody who is interested but really doesn't know the strategy, the approach, if you, you're determined to do this, what would be the best advice? And when, actually, the, the question of when do you start getting paid, let's say, by YouTube, is so um i have to say that youtube is not much of my strength but i could give a basic um explanation to this i think my my superpower is on my facebook my marketing things but what happens with facebook with sorry with um youtube is that um when you start publishing right youtube has a level a number of total views that you must get i can't quote it exactly more that's like what uh, what to what but like you must have about four thousand view hours um i think if you google search that you get that accurately so when you get that you become eligible to monetize your channel meaning when people watch your content um, you get paid for it and you're going to get paid per views in terms of the price or in terms of how much you get paid again like i said it matters on the country where your viewership is coming from so if you're getting views from us um, for example i'll say that around a million views well this is an estimate um not very accurate but around a million views if you get a million views from the uk on youtube uh, from the uk or us on youtube you might be making up to 10 bucks ten thousand bucks but if you get that million views from maybe some lower tier countries you might be living with just around two thousand dollars or something so it all matters on, and also the, um, the, the niche where you are is uh, very, very important. The niche where you are is very important because, um, for example, if you're talking about relationships, um, Google would pay you or YouTube is going to give, is going to pay you higher for views of that relationship and here's the reason let me explain it to you so when you start putting the videos right the idea is that people come and watch you and when people are coming to watch you youtube is going to say that i could put an ad in between your content pay the views they gave people into business have the cap capability of spending more. So depending on your niche, right? If you're in a business niche, let's say, for example, you're teaching entrepreneurs the basics of maybe accounting or maybe how to grow a business, self-discipline and all that, it means you're going to attract people who are business inclined and people who are making money and people who are more liable to spend more. So based on your need, um, the number of value 
portray and make you way money. I, I don't know if this is if it really makes makes sense. So someone in business can have one views or let's say ten thousand views. He will not get paid the same as someone who is uh, uh, publishing something like love and relationship and has ten thousand views. It might change slightly in how much you're being paid. Again, just Google it. Google it. You get all of this. Um, YouTube is not so much, but this is what I know. And with experience with me working with some of the, um, some, a few YouTubers around, I have a YouTube channel, but I honestly do not use it just because I'm trying to focus my energy on what I'm very good at, at this point, sometime in the future, I may, but I'm trying to be more focused with what I do. I see some, some comments. Um, let me see. So inspiring to see Africans in the digital center. Yeah. Kwame, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you to Google as well for sharing. Okay, yeah. Thank you for the stats. 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch uh, hours yearly. Okay. So, Damaris, the there you go. Someone mm -hmm. has put it in the chat. So, you need to have 1,000 subscribers and then 4,000 watch hours yearly for you to apply for monetization. Okay. Then, Does the income you mentioned take into account individual income taxes that one might need to pay e.g. as a foreign student in the U.S.? No, uh, Michael, I don't think so. I think that's kind of considered as a business, um, whatever you're getting from these platforms, from YouTube or all of those platforms is uh, considered like a business. You're going to pay tax for REITs like a business or maybe as a solopreneur or as a self-employed person. It's not doesn't relate to what you're getting or what you have to do with your personal finance as an international student. So if you're making $1,000, um, they're going to chop their tax for $1,000. It, it, it's not their business how much you earn elsewhere. They'll just cut what's their, their part. And actually, this is one of the problems we we'll even face in Cameroon. Um, when it comes to like the tax issues, it's really a big problem. We have like two main problems in Cameroon, which I hope that we get to uh, our government works on the payment systems and then uh, um, taxes. For example, in the US, you easily just pick up your PayPal and send money to someone. But in Cameroon, it's not that way. We have to find really some, 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 some back doors and do that, even Stripe. Can you imagine that for us for to be able to use Stripe, sometimes you have to get someone in the US to sign into Stripe and then create an account, fulfill, go past all the tax stuff and then give you access to the account and then you take and then you incorporate to your website and you do all that, some of those maneuvers that we have to do. But again, hopefully our economy is growing and we can be able to keep speaking up and policies change to favor the youths and those that are coming behind us. I'm saying it, Manuel, I think it's, it looks like we, we need to be wrapping up here. It doesn't, right. I don't really see that anyone else is uh, trying to comment or ask a question. Okay. All right. Okay. So I, I really want to thank our presenters so very much. First, in the beginning, I said it's a big sacrifice to be up in after midnight or close to midnight to be part of this discussion. But that really states the importance of discussions like this. We, we're privileged to have uh, presenters or people who can commit to share the information using their expertise and experiences in our platform, the African Tea Time series. We are very grateful for your time, Ari and, and Google. And we do hope that we will be able to continue engaging with us in, in many different ways. Uh, somebody mentioned that's Pechu. Pechu invited you, not invited you, but asked me to keep you as Spartans. And I said, you already Spartans. I don't really have to do anything more <laughs> to make you Spartans. We, you are welcome to the Spartan family by virtue that you're here um, sharing this important information with us. So thank you so much. and. Uh, 
it's it's really important to from both of your presentations to see how you you were both a able to follow your passions in very innovative and creative ways and it, productive ways as well you're contributing to society but uh, at the same time you're not shelving what you think it's you. you you're pushing your way forward with what you 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 believe you you're supposed to do for society but at the same time you're you're you're, you're being productive like you're you're juggling both your personal um path together with uh, contributing to society. So I, I really admire what you do. And I saw um, that was Kwame also shared the same thing. When you see young people not trying to sacrifice who they are, you're not trying to be somebody else for you to, let's say, make money for you to do. You're trying to be you, you're trying to chase your passion, but at the same time, you're, you're living true to what you think you're supposed to give back society. So. On a personal level, I definitely appreciate so much. And uh, as I said in the beginning, this uh, video is going to be shared on YouTube, which makes it easier for us when, if somebody yeah, didn't make it today, they should be able to learn what the discussion uh, was touching on today. And I think this is one of the important topics. And the questions I was asking are questions that people ask randomly, you know, but getting a, 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 an, an expert answer, that is usually helps so i want to close here if you have any comments google and array you're welcome to but other than that we wind up and, and close and look forward to another meeting which is um on march 31st and it's going to focus on uh, africa china relations and i am looking forward to it if you have time please join us again it's a uh, the same link that you used to get in, but we can still share the information with everybody else. So please Google any last comments. Um, no final comments from me. Just thank you again for having me um, and for a really good conversation. I think the questions were um, really good questions and the discussion was just a really fruitful discussion. I think it's, um, it's nice to, hear the perspectives and some of the curiosities of other people as well. So yeah, thank you so much for this platform. You're very welcome, Gugu. And uh, Ari, please. Yeah, thank you to everyone for being part of this. And also I'm, I'm really, really appreciative to Ali who um, kind of connected us, Damaris. I, I think that was like a very, at, at the point when we needed to and he did it the right thing and I'm, I'm very appreciative to him and then to everyone, um, Emmanuel, um, to just all of those who have been on chat and to kind of witness this. So thank you and um, I appreciate you guys. Let's keep chasing our dreams and making more money. Yes. So thank you so much everyone and for our audience for joining in, asking the questions because questions help in broadening mm -hmm. our thoughts. And, and our activities. So thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Bye-bye.